Hello, everybody. Welcome to Thursday Night Live with Bill Tucci. Behold his mighty hand. Tucci gang, Tucci gang, Tucci gang, Tucci gang, Tucci gang, Tucci gang, Tucci gang. Just want to manage expectations. Weird. Weird. This is the worst. Oh, the bell. Wrong way, bro. Wrong way. No, bro. It's been a crazy day. What's up, Scalawags? How you doing? I'm doing good, Mr. Tucci. How you doing, brother? Doing great. I'm one of my favorite comic creators on today. Yeah, on you're still hung over. You're still hung over with those glasses on, huh? Still hung over, bro. Man, late night last night. Yeah. Oh, you could keep them on. Come on. I was just messing yeah, with you. I don't like them. I'll just put these on. There you go. The that I wore in my hoodie. There you go. My glasses that I wore in my hoodie, and then I washed and dried them. <laughs> oh, geez. Jeez, man. We got a great show, everybody. Thank you guys yes. for joining us. Citizen Ronan, Randy Howell, the J. Argonaut, Dan Genovese. Good to see all you guys. Rusty, everybody, our friends are here. Thank you guys for joining us. We have a great show for you tonight. Um, with a one and only Mr. Bill Willingham, uh, Eisner Award uh, winner. Just, I mean, what an amazing career he's had. Uh, and just a real writer's writer, someone that everyone, everyone's a fan of his work. Um, and just, man, just one of the, one of the good guys uh, in comics. And, and Bill has found his way into the, uh, <laughs> into the news this week. Um, which is uh kind of sent shockwaves throughout the entire industry, wouldn't you say so, Niall? <laughs> I would say, I would say good shockwaves to me. Yeah, good shockwaves, just, just the biggest pair, and just again, one of the good guys. And ladies and gentlemen, from the wilds of Minnesota, the one, the only Mr. Bill Willingham. Hello, hey, bud. <laughs> Hello, how are you, sir? I am, I'm too good. I'm very good. Thank you for having me tonight. Yeah, you look good too. You look you look rested. You look healthy. You look happy. You look I'm, relieved. I'm mostly rested. I'm mostly healthy, and I'm uh, occasionally happy. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're really happy to have you on. We've actually been wanting to have you on for a while, so this was good timing that we could get you on to the to the show. And we're so happy that uh, you you that your internet is working and that you're you're streaming and that you and Niall were able to put that bad boy together because I know we've had some experience before, uh, namely on uh, Ethan streaming with you know with uh, the Kings and all and yeah uh, kind of Ma uh, what's it Max headroomed out a little bit but you're here now and we're on so yeah. Rusty Baker says oh my God it's Bill this is so incredible all Thank right you. Thank you for that uh, so Bill um. If you don't mind, uh, tell a little bit about yourself uh, to the people out there. We usually go about 45 minutes, uh, you know, and... Uh, He's lying. You know you? Uh, yeah, to an hour. Then I, yeah, I just, <laughs> He I always says 45, 45 minutes, minutes, Bill, and no it turns leaves. into like an hour and a half. And then we go for an hour. Um, yeah, that's fine. But yeah, like if you tell us a little bit about yourself, about your 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 upbringing, about how you got into comics, and uh, especially about that, uh, is that a pith helmet up there, up and behind you? That is a, a pith helmet, as uh, some out there might know. I'm quite the fan of uh, uh, the movie Zulu, oh my God. Uh, which which depicts the Battle of Rourke's Drift. Are you and, talking about the events of, what was it, January 22nd to 23rd, 1879? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Perhaps so. Yes, indeed. Um, a friend one year for Christmas uh, got me... Uh, a pith helmet uh, of the type you can't, I don't know if you can see the insignia, but that, that is the insignia of the, uh, the troops manning the uh, uh, mission uh, mm. station at Rorkstra. Was that like um, the 29th foot or something, I think? 
I'm it a fan is, of the battle as well. I'm a yeah, uh, 24th foot, 24th uh, foot, and uh, I got a uh, a pistol uh, of of the type that the officers were using, uh, an actual working uh, pistol, and a uh, um, Victoria Cross uh, medal. Not one of the actual ones from the battle. That would have been incredible, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he uh, he he set me up pretty well. When when the hordes come here, and I'm manning the melee bags in defense, uh, you know, I'm go I'm going to have the pith helmet on. I'm going to have the uh, the brom head pistol, yes. and uh, and I will be shouting, "Hold them, hold them!" Yeah. Um, uh, while you know everyone breaks into a spontaneous uh, men of harlot. Uh, yes. And anyway. was that a, uh, is, is that a, what did he say? It was a, a 45 caliber, uh, what do you call it? A 45 caliber something, you know, full metal jacket or whatever. Oh, at the end when he said yeah. it's a miracle. And he goes, it, if it. Oh, it's a great line. Hang was on. It was a, uh, a 45 caliber Martini and Rossi uh, uh, breech loader miracle. Um, and and as you know, my my favorite of uh, uh, of all the uh, the soldiers there, uh, Color Sergeant Bourne says, uh, and and a bayonet with some guts behind it. Um, God, I love that movie. Yeah, with some guts behind it. I I think that I love that film uh, myself. I don't know, Scal, if you're familiar with it. I think it's 1964, maybe. Um, uh, that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah, and it's uh, Chard and Bromhead, right? The Chard and Bromhead, yep, uh, and good. this is uh, uh, this is um, uh, uh, Michael Caine's first starring role. Yeah, uh, and he just he just came out of the box, you know, fully formed. Um, he was great in this. Uh, uh, but uh, the uh, oh, Nigel, what's it? Who the fellow who plays Color Sergeant Bourne? Also, his his other big role, um, any one of them would have put him in in my uh, Hall of Fame. But his other big role was he was Hercules in the Jason and the Argonauts movie. So, how can oh, you do better? Right. Than that's that? right. <laughs> and I love the I love Michael Caine's you know this Cockney, you know from East London I think or the East End of London, and here he's playing this patrician right this patrician. Oh, this snob! Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, just, uh, it's a it's amazing if you if you're fans of Michael Caine and again I love that film, I love the tactics they used, um, and uh, just uh, you know you look I remember when I went to the Alamo for the first time and then saw how they at the museum there they have how it's laid out, uh -huh. and you think and they just try to defend too huge of an area. Yes. And I'm like, man, if they had just done, you know, well, this is proceeding, obviously, the, the, the Alamo's 1836. But uh, if they had pulled in their forces, because they had cannon, they had some, you know, they had a pretty sizable amount, not, not like yeah. 5,000 Mexicans. But I think they could have held off and, and had a far more successful um, defense had they pulled back. Mm -hmm. and, and you saw what, what Chard and Bromhead did and how they just kept condensing that, that perimeter uh and then of course oh, yeah yeah you, you know falling, and, and just falling back uh, until the final redoubt oh my god that yeah, is just just extraordinary just so it really is it's a great film anyone out there oh boy bill maybe uh when it comes around in january we should do a saturday morning show and and screen that movie maybe at like at one and a half speed so we don't get a strike and we can <laughs> commentary on it <laughs> with no sound I'm, I'm there oh gosh yes Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, anyway, so about yourself, um, you know, uh, where are you from? Um, uh, you know, well, how, how you got into comics, the whole thing. Yeah, I was uh, raised an army brat. Um, my uh, dad was in the army. He was he was actually in the uh, uh, the Navy for one uh, tour uh, before the army uh, decided um, that. Uh, uh, the Navy was not the service for him, uh, since 
you know, the, the whole uh, being in jail with the chance of drowning uh, mm -hmm. aspect of it. Uh, switched <laughs> to the Army, was a lifer in the Army. Uh, I was raised all over the place. Um, uh, a good deal of that time in Germany. Uh, and uh, regardless of what else I was going to do or be interested in uh, with our family, it was just known that, uh, but when it's your turn to, you know, do your service, you're going to do that. That wasn't uh, subject to discussion. Um, my dad was progressive enough to allow me some choice in uh, which service I entered uh, with, with his thumb on the scale, but you know, we're an army family. Um, uh, so I did, but yeah, we moved all the time when, when uh, my parents settled down and I uh, uh, began to realize that we weren't gonna uh, keep moving. Uh, by then it becoming grain, so I moved all the time. Uh, part of going into the comic book business was just that it was one of the professions where you could kind of do it wherever you were. And I, mm. I was struck with wanderlust like no one's business. Um, I used to have the, the absolute law that I would never own more than I could fit into a single uh, van to, wow. to move with. Um, wow. And kept to it for many years. Uh, and now, no, I cannot <laughs> move again. Um, uh, you know, and, and will not be moved. So here we are. Uh, I got interested in comic because I liked drawing as a kid. Uh, I had 3 million older sisters, uh, and <laughs> you know, uh, everyone thought my, uh, parents were Catholic because our, our family was large enough and, <laughs> and, uh, no, not Catholic. It's just that uh, when my dad was in the service, uh, the army wouldn't uh, uh, wouldn't ship your television sets around the globe with them. So we had to find things to do uh, other than watch TV. And you know, uh, with my parents, it's you know have a big family. Um, yeah. But because of that, I was second to youngest in the in the group. Uh, I had any number of older sisters uh, able to read to me and they were usually willing to do so. Uh, so I was reading comic books long before I could read comic books. Um, that's what the sisters were for, the, the reading part. Uh, I loved them forever. Uh, yeah, I, I sort of knew when I finished my uh, service that that's what I was going to try and do. What branch of service you're in? Army. Oh, thank you for your yeah. service. Yeah, thank you for your service. What was your uh, MOS? Uh, well, they've changed it. It was uh, 95 Bravo, which was uh, military police. Mm. Uh, since then, military police is a different MOS. Um, it. Uh, I was vaguely interested in police work, and I thought, well, if I'm going to have to do military service anyway, might as well become military police and see if, if I have more, more than just a taste for police doing that. And, and did a few things that, that normal police don't do. Uh, once during Reforger, which was uh, Germany's big war games every year during while the Cold War was still going on, um, I had to pull over a main battle tank that was on the wrong road and, and issue a ticket. Uh, <laughs> so this day, I, I have no idea what I was going to do if the tank didn't pull over. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, you, uh, yeah, I had a great time, but I realized that at best I was a kid playing cops and robbers which is, I don't think was the, the best uh, mature attitude to bring into that profession. And that kind of, okay, it was gonna be comics anyway, but now now at least I know, now I've scratched that itch. Mm -hmm. Were you ever in Berlin? Were you ever in the Berlin Brigade or were you in West Germany? Well, no, uh, Berlin, yes and no. Berlin was a, um, they, they had a permanent party there, but for most of us that were uh, stationed 
uh, throughout the, the rest of Germany. Um, it was a, a kind of a prestige visita visitation time where you get for two weeks, you get to go be, be Berlin uh, soldiers. Um, boy, I'm glad I was not stationed there full time. Those, those were some strack individuals. They, uh, um, they were like the, the guards uh, between uh, North and South Korea. They just, you know, uh, they were the best of the best, the elite of the elite. Um, I was in Berlin just long enough to opine to my buddies when we were looking at the Berlin Wall that this will never come down in our lifetime. You saw and I had all, all the reasons why, and, uh, and boy, was I wrong. Um, yeah. yeah. You got to love that with old Ronnie Reagan, when he's basically like, okay, this is what we're going to spend. Try to keep up. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> this is the power of the United States. This is the power of capitalism. Good luck. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for your service, sir. Uh, ah, yeah. You're you know, they, they, I don't know if you if you're aware. In November of 1984, uh, I think it was 84. Um, there was the the little Korean War at the DMZ, where there was a yeah. Soviet. Are you familiar with that story? The Soviet defector. He defected. Uh, like, I, I have not heard the term the Little Korean War, but that that sounds fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this Soviet defector Niall uh, came. Uh, um, <clears throat> he was there, for, you know, pretending to take, you know, he's he's taking pictures and all, and then he just bolted across the um, the, the checkpoint that what do they call it? The something a piece or whatever that that area. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, like with Trump and and uh, yeah, yeah. stepped over and yeah. stuff. And he he ran, and like 15 of them, cocoms, you know, chased after him, and uh, started shooting at him. And it started this big firefight. Um, we killed two of them at least, wounded a bunch of others because it was all the it was all the military police then, who were there, and they yep. mobilized real quick. There was one lieutenant, I think, or a captain that got those guys. In, and there was the punch bowl down there, and they had them down in there. And there was a uh, a uh, a South Korean soldier, a rock uh, soldier, was killed, and a uh, and a, a U.S. Um, military policeman was killed in it oh. in the firefight. And then the once it was done, uh, because it happened so quick, uh, that the North Koreans asked to take their dead. To, and they're wounded back across, and, and it was an army captain, and he allowed him to do it. And then you heard shots from the other side uh, of the uh, on the North Korea that they actually the ones that failed and went across. They execute the North Koreans executed their own soldiers. Wow, pretty pretty crazy. I think it was November of of eighty four. But I digress. I'm sorry. I just love history and stuff like that. And you start talking about those things, and I I just go off. Jeez. But, all right. So you get out of the army. Uh, what year was that? Uh, I went in in 77. I came out in the summer of 1980. Oh, so like eight short years later or so, that wall came tumbling down. Yeah. That's cool. All right, so it's 1980, and you're, you know, you're, you're a creative. Now, where do you go? What do you do? How do you get into where you are today? Well, I uh, spent some of my time in the Army sending off samples to Marvel. Uh, they sent back encouraging letters. I used, to, boy, I used to hold on to these letters, uh, and they one move after another they disappeared. I got one from Marie Severin that was so encouraging. Anyway, um, nice, but you know you're not ready yet, kid. Uh, and she was absolutely right. Uh, in the meantime, uh, because Dungeons and Dragons was a new thing, uh, I applied to the art department of TSR, who mm -hmm. uh, does Dungeons and Dragons, as kind of uh, the equivalent of a fallback school. It's like, well, if I can't, if I can't exit the army directly into comic books, uh, I'll do this for a while, and did for a year. I uh, used that year to get my uh, portfolio in shape to uh, break into uh, to comics. Now, where was your first, once you started breaking into comics, I mean, wh where was your first gig, like your big gig? Well, there was a couple of firsts. Uh, mm -hmm. While I was still associated with TSR, 
uh, they started running ads in the back of uh, Marvel comics that were in comic book form showing Dungeon Adventures. Uh, so my first uh, got paid for a comic skid was, was getting paid to draw those for a while. Um, that I didn't really count as real comics. Um, uh, then I uh, uh, finally quit TSR because I had been offered uh, work uh, at, uh, I would save up my money and do new samples and, and uh, fly out to uh, New York uh, as often as I could during that year at TSR. They knew I had one foot out the door the moment uh, uh, I arrived. Um, uh, but uh, a editor there at Marvel uh, promised me work. Um, so I went home, quit TSR, uh, cashed in my uh, TSR stock, uh, moved out to Long Island and uh, uh, showed up there and said, okay, I'm ready for work. And uh, that editor whom I will not uh, reveal, <laughs> uh, I, I still carry a bit of a grudge, uh, said, oh, well, I didn't mean you know, that we're going to give you work right away. I'm so, I, I was mostly just saying you're ready for work. And mostly I have the power to, to show your stuff around. But now that you're in the area, you can do that as easily. Uh, good luck. Bye-bye. And uh, oh. so I, I spent another year in Long Island trying to uh, uh, to break in. Um, wow. Where in Long Island did you live? Oh, Stony Brook. Uh, oh, okay. Stony Brook, Long Island. Yeah. Um, I'm, right I'm across all the way street. south of you. Oh, um, really? Yeah, I'm I'm in Bayport. I don't care ah. yeah, if people know where I live. Yeah, I'm I live... straight at the bottom. I take 97 Nichols Road all the way up to Stony Brook. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I used to uh, sneak across the street to, uh, to uh, the university there mm -hmm. and uh, just attend classes um, for, for no, I just sit in. Uh, mostly art classes, and uh, uh, there used to be this old sitcom called Hank about a guy who was getting a college education for free by just sneaking into classes. That was me for that year. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, and I would uh, visit DC. The thing about DC at the time, Marvel would only look at uh, uh, sample pages of their characters, and DC. Uh, did not have that uh, policy. So since I was going to be drawing pre-sample pages, it was always Marvel characters uh, at the time. Uh, but finally, I, I was not getting any joy from them, and the independents were, were just starting to, to spring up. Uh, First Comics announced its existence. Uh, Pacific Comics had started. Mm. Um, and an outfit called Noble Comics from Grand Rapids, Michigan started. Uh, so I, I sent out, uh, I did new sample pages of just generic superheroes. To I wasn't going to try and do different pages of each of their characters. So I sent that out, and uh, uh, Mike Gusevich at Noble Comics was the first to answer. I think he received the package. Two days later, I picked up the phone and offered me work. Uh, so I packed up my my stuff from uh, Long Island and, and took a bus out to Grand Rapids and uh, got there, asked what they're going to have me working on. And, and Mike kind of looks at me a little confused, says, what do you mean what are you going to work on? I go, well, yeah, what do you want me to uh, uh, to do here? I, you know, where where do I get started? He goes, well, you're going to do that, that book you pitched us. <laughs> uh, I didn't pitch a book. I didn't think I was pitching a book. I did generic superhero pages to show that I could. And that was the uh, the first Elementals pages I mm had -hmm. done. Awesome. Uh, so, of course, you know, and, and he's looking at me like, you did pitch the book, right? And I, oh, I go, yes, of course. I meant, yes, I will be doing that, of course. Yeah, but yes. I, I meant, was there anything else you wanted me to do as well? Um and that's how I learned that I had actually pitched a book rather than uh, just tried to uh, impress them with my ability to draw. Right. So when you're getting that news, though, it's like, all right, now, now you're walking out of there. 
you have this book <laughs> that you pitched that you didn't intentionally pitch. I mean, what were you thinking at that point? Yeah. Uh, better start drawing. Yeah. yeah. Just, um, yeah. The nice thing about being. thrown in the deep end uh, my father taught my brother and i to swim um but the nice thing is is you don't have a lot of time to uh, examine your options you you need to start swimming so i started swimming I, you know i just started drawing awesome that's crazy that's, that's kind of crazy but I, like really kind of a really cool opportunity at the same time you're just trying to get work and then all of a sudden you basically just got thrown to work from your generic samples yeah yeah yeah, that's pretty cool. And and who were your who were your your guys your gals that you liked? Whose work did you like adore? Did you try to emulate? Who were your influences? Uh, I wanted to to be the illegitimate love child of uh, Neil Adams, John Byrne, and Michael Golden oh, uh, yes. at the time. Uh, that changed over time. So many of the artists that I thought were kind of uh, dull and not as exciting. Uh, I've since realized uh, they were the ones that had it all along. Alex Toth being a good example. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that guy can draw. It didn't look, you know, there's not much on the page of an Alex Toth panel. Uh, uh, line is is the exact perfect line. You He needed to suggest whatever it is he needed to show. Um, at some point, I, I realized that that was, uh, I wish that I'd emulated kind of that group of artists uh, instead of the kind of flash uh, over substance ones that I did because uh, uh, man, was there, was there an awakening when I realized that was, that was the guy. Mm -hmm. And there's so many that, that have since, come to that realization i mean you're you're uh um uh see now i'm gonna forget every name and in, in, in the business but uh chris samney and and uh mm -hmm. um uh was it lee weeks and, and mm. oh and, yeah great uh, yeah. uh john paul leon before yeah that. Mm -hmm. they, that guy's they like, knew yeah, yeah. They knew what was going on. They draw their asses and Mignola, you know, with him. Oh yeah, just watching amazing. watching Mignola. He was one of the first um, uh, comic artists I'd met who was at the same stage. Which is, uh, he and Art Adams were at uh, San Diego Con back when it was in the basement of of some hotel out there. Uh, early on, the first one I went to, and they had. Uh, come out there specifically to break into comics and had just gotten the the attention of uh of marvel um uh and wonderful wonderful artist but to see uh mike go from the terrific artist he was to begin with and then pare it down and pare it down and pare it down to its its elemental essential mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. over the years it's just just incredible. I would, uh, uh, I'd love to spend some time in that guy's mind just to see the world the way he does. Uh, uh, but you know, then could I ever get out again? I mean, uh, years later, I'd accidentally hit that switch to go back to myself and and wonder what the hell I've been doing for. 20 yeah, years. yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's he's a genius in this in this business, and uh, yeah. Uh, he's one of those that makes me think that if I keep plugging away at this, I will indeed make it. But, yeah, uh, someday we'll get point. there. You know, yeah. I, yeah. yeah I, I remember seeing um, with him, I don't know which came first. It, if I think it was Gotham by Gaslight was first. And then he did that amazing adaptation of uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh yeah, uh, Gotham by Gaslight was first. Yeah, uh, Cosmic Odyssey was before that, which was okay. just kooky and amazing. Yeah, um, and various other things. And of course, he uh, created uh, Rocket Raccoon. Yeah, uh, he was the first artist on on that. Yeah. 
So now let me ask you now, you know, and a lot of people are probably, you know, want us to get to these points though, but let's talk fables. I mean, it's a great okay. series. I've been, you know, reading that almost close to since it came out. Um, you know, how, how did you come up with the idea? How did fables come to be? And second to that question is, did you think it would take off to be as successful as it has been? At the time I came up with fables, um, I was doing a lot of uh, fill in the gaps work with DC, specifically with the uh, Vertigo editor, Shelley Bond. Um, as DC would often do, uh, when they have a hit, they would try and make a, a cottage industry out of it. In this case, the Sandman stuff, where, yeah. where Neil Gaiman was gonna do this much, but, and then move on, which he did. Well, they needed to have a franchise out of it, so they spun off uh, the dreaming and and uh, they spun off, you know, miniseries featuring a different character, that type of thing. Uh, so I got fairly steady work uh, from Shelley, who was the last editor I worked with at Kamiko back during the Elementals days. I was the first uh, writer artist she got to work with after getting the job out of, out of college. Uh, and, and I guess she always had some fondness about that. Um, but a lot of people wisely told her, don't don't give this guy work, he'll let you down. He, he kind of doesn't turn things in in a timely manner, which was true too often. Right. Um, but she did. And uh, um, I did several uh, projects for her that kind of garnered uh, a little bit of critical attention, but sold in the dozens. I mean, they just mm. didn't sell. Um, and so I, while continuing to do those kinds of things, when she picked up the phone uh, to me, uh, I started to ask myself, what, what do I want to draw? What things am I interested in? If I'm going to do this kind of stuff, uh do something i'm interested in because if it's only going to sell on the dozens why not at least make it something that uh that my passions drive it um and i like the idea of uh secret societies um i liked uh fairy tale type characters uh mythology all of that uh i pared it down to well i'm either going to do uh, mythological figures in some kind of secret underground uh, culture or fairy tale creatures. Uh, it was almost a mental flip of the coin. Uh, I think I went with fairy tale uh, characters only because not much had been done with them recently, but everyone was doing uh, secret mythology amongst this type of stuff. So I went with the uh, the less uh overdone uh group of characters uh and then in one conversation i told shelly she was trying to get me to do this uh sassy sisters as private eyes thing that she had an idea for uh and i said that sounds interesting we'll talk about it but i have to uh finish up this proposal i'm sending out and she goes what she's very territorial mm. uh, and i explained to her well it's not a vertigo thing so don't worry i uh it's not something vertigo would be interested in uh because at the time uh god bless them they wanted you know pouty lip teenagers that were all you know rebels against the man yeah um and that just wasn't uh wasn't anything that that interested me um so i explained to her what it was and she said oh no that is a vertigo title and you're going to submit it. this was on friday she said you're going to have it on my desk by monday and we will uh, uh we will accept it within the week um and that was a bold statement on her part because dc had a, a reputation well deserved for taking a long time and a lot of fiddling around to accept stories 
Uh, my favorite being the uh, short-lived Hammerlock. You've never heard of it, but it was uh, Chris Sprouse's first work. It was a friend of mine, Keith Wilson. Uh, they took eight years pitching that Whoa. book wow. uh, to DC, de who demanded change after change after change after change. Finally, they did it uh, uh, in time for, oh, it was gorgeous, but no one... No one was really interested in it. I told I told Shelley, you know, I don't have eight years of my life to go down this road, and she accepted it as a challenge. That said, okay, we're you'll have an answer, yes or no, within a week, and I did. And then, okay, so that okay, so now you get it. Do you pitch? You know, to Vertigo. So, do you initially pitch it as? Uh, what, what, did you go in that it's going to be an ongoing, or were you thinking a, a story arc, a four or five, six issue story arc, maybe? Like, how did you you I, go in there that you're pitching pr primarily a creator own? You know, yeah, concept. I went in there thinking it had the legs to be an ongoing. Uh, uh, Karen Berger who was in charge of Vertigo at the time, didn't quite see it. She said, we can do a six issue miniseries, but I I can't for the life of me think how you could get more than six issues out of this concept. Uh, and I accepted that as a challenge. Uh, luckily, Jeanette Kahn, who was the uh, publisher president mm -hmm. of the time, uh, she had one foot out the door already. She was leaving to go to Hollywood, but she championed it. She saw it and, and uh, uh, my understanding is she told them, you know, give him what he wants. We're doing this. Um, turns out she wanted it as a property because she was going into movies and she said, I can, I can make a movie out of this. Right. And they almost did. She teamed up with uh, uh, Lisa Henson, who was as delightful a person as you'll ever meet. Um, they tried to get a movie going, but uh, Warner never, uh, never really released them to do the uh the movie uh in the meantime everyone else was coming along at the time uh fables was flavor of the month by that time mm -hmm. uh they all wanted it uh and warner kind of snatched it out of their hands to to, to chase this nebulous thing and they, they basically chased one studio after another for 10 years and and uh, turned down just lots and lots of offers uh, because it wasn't exactly right uh, with this mm -hmm. until finally 10 years later, other things like Once Upon a Time, they, they finally came along and said, look, if they're, they're determined not to do this, um, do you mind if we take a shot at it? And, and uh, rightly so. Everyone says I should be, you know, those dirty rats against the Once Upon a Time and the Grim, fair, uh, whatever people. Um, but no, we had a, a ten-year head start, so yeah. we couldn't do it. What the hell? Now, now, do you think? Do you think that they they went their own route and created these? Because because I, I you know I followed it right. I followed the the news and stuff and and things where you know it was a prospect for a film. It was prospect for television shows. We know they created a video game, right? Uh, off of it, uh, yeah. Was it Wolf Among Us? I think it was. Yeah. Um, but now, now, do you think that did they just take matters into their own hands, and it was cheaper for them to just maybe make their own series that kind of had a similar? There was there's similarities in both series. Yeah, I think so, and I think there was some frustration too because it's like these guys with ABC. We almost had a deal in place, and then. Mm -hmm. Uh, I never got the full story, but our guys from uh, Warner, at the same time, whenever Fables was about to become a movie, some hotshot new flavor of the month TV writer would come in and say, you know, I'll write for you if you can get me Fables. And they snatched it away and gave it to this guy. Right. And then when he just about um has something going with it some hot shot flavor of the month movie writer would say well if you can get me fables so 
DC or Time Warner or whatever kept taking it away and giving it to someone else. My personal theory is uh, the the giant mega corporations have as much value or more value in something not getting made as getting made. Mm -hmm. um, when you have something like Fables on the books with the the as corporate assets, they can say it's worth this much. You know, it's a ten million dollar property or whatever the the number is. You actually make the movie and it doesn't make that. Mm. Suddenly you have to answer to your stockholders like, well, it only made six million dollars. That means you just lost us four million dollars. Right. I think that's the economics that is partially driving now, a lot of indecision. Yeah. Yeah. As someone who's experienced something similar um, with my own comic book property and, you know, you get the, the dang of the pirate and all like, oh, let's, oh, let's, they, you go out to Hollywood, all this stuff. But anyway, um, were you uh, in on any of these meetings? Were you there for these creative meetings, for these pitch meetings? Or did, was it mostly them? That for did? Jeanette Kahn and Lisa Henson, I was. Mm -hmm. uh, I was treated so well. You know, the uh, uh, they were so good to me, I was a little frustrated because I kind of wanted the whole Hollywood experience. I wanted at least one person to say, you'll never work in this town again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not only did I not get that, uh, they were they were incredible. Um, but during my trips out there, I I, uh, I moved to Vegas during that time specifically because they said, look, are you willing to come to move to L.A. Uh, so we can get this thing going? I go, well, no, 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 no. I'm not going to live in, in the People's Republic of California, but I'll live as close to it as I can. And, you know, and it's a four hour drive. I'll, I'll be there anytime you need me. Uh, and was. Um, and the other L.A. Hollywood cliche is I never once got stuck in traffic, um, <laughs> which kind of disappointed. It's like, come on, the the you know every freeway is a parking lot. I yeah. wanted the full experience, and you're not giving me anything to work with here. Uh, later on, years down the road, when I had an agent and we all went uh, uh, to to have many, many meetings uh, in LA, like, you know, 10, 15 years later. Um, I told him about that. It goes, you know, there's something, there's something uh, in my corner that we're not gonna ever get stuck in traffic. And he's <laughs> one of these guys, he's got meetings all across town. He goes, oh, we have to leave three hours early just because of this. And he called me on it, but we never did. And uh, uh, I'm sure all the luck I've had in Hollywood was used just to have good traffic. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've been it all. Um, but yeah, I, I've been in the meetings uh, from time to time. Uh, I was actually hired by New Line Cinema to write a treatment for Fables. Uh, they paid me, but uh, the moment they got it, they said, uh, this is great, but we can't afford to, to do this movie. Um, and I go, yeah, yeah, well, what about, you know, because their whole idea is New Line was the, the smaller, more indie films uh, imprint or what have you, whereas the big time, uh, Warner Brothers was the big biggie. And uh, uh, so I said, well, look, just have Warner Brothers do it. And they said, well, no, it doesn't work like that because we decided we made a deal that Warner Brothers would have the rights to all the DCU stuff, the Superman, the Batman, or whatever, and we would get all the rights to the Vertigo stuff. So this is too expensive a movie to make. Good job, kid, but no. Uh, at the same time, because we're not willing to take this hat off and put this other hat on. Uh, and that was when David Heyman, the, uh, the producer of the Harry Potter stuff, as as much a success story in Hollywood at the time, he wanted to do it. And they still just, nah, nah, nah. God, So yeah, man. I've been in some meetings enough to where 
I decided I never, ever need to be in uh, another Hollywood meeting again. Um, it's sometimes a lovely waste of time, but it's all a waste of time. Uh, I actually have it written into my agreements with uh, new publishers that, uh, um, you know, if you're going to make a movie out of this, uh, I will never get on a plane and go help you try and sell it to those people. I don't know how anything gets made in that yeah. town. Anyway, so I'm babbling. Not yeah. at all. So, so, and then getting that, that we progress. I mean, how many issues of Fables were produced? Uh, 150 of the main series. Um, probably 100 of the Jack of Fables spinoffs and various other specials and, and what have you. Uh, probably about two to 300 all told. And then, of course, we're in the middle of the, uh, they wanted to do a 20th anniversary uh, Fables revival. So 12 mm -hmm. issues of that are being produced. Uh, the 10th of those 12 issues is about to come out. Okay. And we got we got a super chat here from Matt Hep, five dollars. Thank you, Matt. Fables may have gotten uh may have not gotten huge mainstream success, but was a massive influence like the Fist of the North Star, Vampire Hunter D, and Elric of Melbourne. Did I say that right? Malibane. Malibane. Thank you. Thank Malibane. you. Malibane. Yeah. Malibane. But so so we're at this point now, and for the past what has it been about a Week, six days a week ago. and a half or so six days ago you know we see the news and for indie yeah. comics creators like our, ourselves here and loving the indie community and basing this channel primarily on it um you know what we saw was just like a champion move like wow this is this is amazing uh and you know the articles gave some details uh little bits on the agreements and whatnot but it basically, you know, headlines, you know, creator of fables is now making fables a domain, a uh, public domain property. Yep. Could you uh, dive into uh, maybe what, what, what made this happen? What, what caused you to say, Hey, you know what, if, if this is how it's going to be, I'm just going to make it public domain. Well, sort of, I sort of explain myself in, in broad strokes. Um, all the people that were anywhere close to being uh, fair and reasonable at DC are gone. Uh, mm -hmm. They have, over the last few years, been replaced. The the fellow uh, Mark Doyle, who first asked me, who first floated the idea of bringing Fables back for the 20th anniversary, he is gone. Uh, Dan DiDio, who was still running on the DCU at the time and who helped uh, pitched this idea to me and, and, uh, uh, get it going. He's gone, you know, yeah, they've been replaced by a revolving door of anonymous people. I mean, in the two years since I finished writing the 12 scripts for the, these 12 new issues, mm -hmm. um, there have been so many replacements of editors in the Fables, DC, Black Lake, whatever they're calling themselves today, offices, uh, that sometimes uh, editors would come, in, come into the office never having read Fables, probably barely having read a comic, um, never having met the outgoing editor. So there was no handover of information or, or whatever. Um, and uh, um, all they knew from me is that I was some kind of bomb throwing radical uh, who's very hard to work with and actually gets snippy when, when we don't do all the things that we're supposed to do uh, according to our contract with them. Uh, at some point, uh, I believe it was Larry Gannon, who's still up there, who might be the, the last one, said, yeah, you have trouble hearing from your own editors because they're all afraid of you, uh, which is stupid. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a, a, a big 
cuddly teddy bear, honestly. Um, yeah, I'd say so. Would you say so, Scala? But uh, I would say so. Yeah. Um, but but also too, they, yeah. <laughs> is you know, I, from the, just from what I've heard from other pros about editorial staff coming in uh, on the Marvel end, on the DC end, is you know, like you said, you know, people coming in that haven't read comics, they don't know the continuity and the legacy and the shoulders of giants that they should be standing on. And, nor do you they know, want to know. Yeah, right. and nor do they no want to know. That they had the love of the medium. Right. That you yeah. need to have. I, I was literally told by some very prominent people in private conversation, and I'll keep their names out of it, that it has come to the point where when they're working on a book, it's almost like the editor comes in with a checklist from some corporate level saying X, Y, and Z needs to be in the book. We don't care. X, Y, and Z needs to be in the book. Not if it's part of the story, not any elements. You have to have X, Y, and Z in it. And the editors are just coming in and just marching orders, having absolutely no experience in the yeah. true storytelling art of, uh, of comic books. Um, I believe that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 the other side. Go ahead. No, please. No, I, I, I wanted to expound upon what you were saying about they don't have the love for the for the industry and Niall then saying that they're standing on the shoulders of the giants and you say that they don't want to know, but um, they have uh, not only that, but they have no problem standing on, on these shoulders of these giants and then pissing on their heads. Yeah, it's yeah, almost yeah. this blatant disregard uh, for what came before. They and they openly say they want to change comics. Yes, they want contempt, to change this contempt for the properties, contempt for the medium. Yeah. Um, yeah. On the legal side, on the the financial side, the business side of DC, uh, they started. Well, they started being slipshod with royalties um, uh, when I oh. would. Uh, Talk Jimmy about... Palmiotti's in the chat says Bill is one brilliant yeah. writer. Love him. Thank Plus you, a fun guy. What's going on, Jimmy? Oh, he's a great. Let's let's bring great, Jimmy. Uh, What's Jimmy doing? Um, send Jimmy the link. We'll send Jimmy the link. Why not? Go ahead, Bill. Sorry. Anyway, one uh, one of their lawyers admitted that look, we don't have any responsibility towards the value of your IP. If, if we're reducing the value of your IP by letting uh, these licensees piss all over it, uh, we have the right to do so. Nor do we have any responsibility. We, we, have, we are the only ones who can go after someone uh, for uh, abusing your property you can't do it independent of us, mm. but we don't have to. And to tell you the truth, we don't want to. Um, this response from DC Comics to my fire and shot across their bows here, uh, that um, this will not stand and they will protect uh, their IP and all this kind of stuff. Uh, this yeah, is the I first time- I can share that right here. Yeah, this is the first time they've been willing to protect fables. And it turns out the one person they want to protect fables from is, is me. Uh, Unbelievable. Yeah, and what about yeah. like, and, and how they refer to it as your IP, as your IP, you're the creator of, and then they come out with this statement and you know, uh, the fables, comic books and graphic novels published by DC and the storylines, characters and elements therein are owned by DC. Yeah, that's, that that's copyright nonsense, and that is, uh, I think they needed to rush something out, and, and they they may have uh, uh, dug themselves into a bit of a hole there, because uh, I've always known, and anyone who's ever done a, a creator-owned project with them knows, they always felt like they were the owner, but they could never, they could never act as if they, they felt that way. They couldn't, they couldn't come out and say it. Now they finally come out and said it. That we're the So they're defending fables against you. And how how, yes. how interesting is that? As they let 
all these other properties that you had, a t like you said, you had a 10 year head start on that inspired them and all these other writers and stuff who wanted to take a crack at it, they were never allowed to. And then they start, you know, the shows once upon a time, et cetera. Um, what was the other one? You said grim or whatever. And it's just very, totally kept right. I could see how frustrating this must be for you and just, holy shit. Yeah, Jimmy um, has a great comment here, actually, Billy. He says it, it's, it, it just is not worth it anymore to create anything new from the ground up for the big two. They have no interest in promoting or partnering with any of us. That's absolutely true. Uh, as I said, two years ago, when I saw the writing in the wall, I, I fired DC, um, which is, I guess, an arrogant move. But uh, I will not do anything. Uh, with them or for them, again, except for try and hold them into this contract that that uh, if you're going to insist that this contract is still going to be enforced, uh, then it goes both ways. Um, I've given them the offer. <laughs> we can meet together and end our contracts with each other, go our, our own way. Um, they not only do not agreed to do that. They never respond to that. They, they just, uh, the problem with having a lot of, of uh, problems with the company to where when you um, list the things that they're doing wrong contract wise, uh, it's a long list. It's like, it's like uh, Martin Luther's, uh, uh, was it 13 uh, things that he nailed to the Wittenberg door? Anyway, when they have an entire list, they cherry pick the two or three things they'll respond to, ignore the rest and think they've dealt with it. Mm. Um, the other option is to send these indictments to them one at a time, uh, which is just another way of now you're working for them. All your time belongs to them. Uh, yeah. So there's there's a few more things about to, to come. Um, mm the the disadvantage of uh doing a sneaky um here's here's a maneuver that they weren't expecting because it comes from a direction they never would have believed would happen uh is that you can do that once i i can't i can't do some big grand thing again uh that they don't expect because you know, it, it, unless they're idiots, I've just trained them to uh, yeah. to look for less than the normal ways of doing it. It's not a gentleman's battle anymore. Nope, it's, no uh, longer. Uh, it's, I want to real quick, because I, I want to get to that moment, Bill. Um, but we also have a, another five dollars super chat. Do you thank you? Uh, well, five pounds from. Uh, All right. Okay. Uh, hi guys, massive fan of Fables. Been following it since twenty since two thousand and three. I'm so sorry the publisher went the way they did, Bill. Um, uh, we'll always uh, Bill will always support you, mate. So thank you for that. Yeah, Bye, I Matt. appreciate it. Thank Matt. you, Matt. And then Matt, of course, we saw Matt again. Uh, thank you, Matt, for that. Um, let me click off of that. Sorry. Matt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, now the question, Bill. So what was again? You're frustrated by them. It's it's been years coming. Uh, you know, you 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 still you, you finished your scripts two years ago um, for the new book. It's not quite done with the with the with that last uh, mini series or maxi series, whatever you want to call it. But when was that f you moment when you're like, you know, fuck this, I'm done, and you made that statement when you made it last week? The final straw was uh, I've been planning something like this for a while, as in trying to find out what the rules of, of the public domain were. And it turns out there's lots of knowledge and scholarship and lawyerly advice about how to keep things out of the public domain, which is what every corporation is trying to do, to hold on to uh, these trademarks and such much longer than, uh, than they should. Uh, there was almost nothing I could find about how to specifically put something into the public domain because no one does that. What kind of an idiot would do that? <laughs> um, but uh, 
the final straw came when I I offered DC a a uh, I don't know uh, much. Uh, I wasn't going to go see them, but look, you know, you guys sent delegations to Europe and England when when you had your falling out with uh, uh, Alan Moore. And not to compare myself to Alan Moore, uh, he deserves delegations and envoys sent his way. Uh, but you can, you know, get on a plane. Let's meet face to face somewhere and hash us out. Uh, they came back with no, but we'll do a conference call. And then I got a call from uh, Jim Lee that said, uh, don't worry, I'm in your corner. I will always be a champion of uh, your rights. I will be there at this meeting uh, and there will be no hanky panky. Uh, and then the meeting, the phone meeting took place and they said, oh yeah, Jim Lee's not going to, uh, to be here. He has no reason to be here. Uh, and he decided that there's no reason for him to be here. And that's the one where they lowered the boom as far as saying, look, you can't sue us because we know how much you make. Um, hmm. You can't force us to protect the uh, value of your IP because we can do what we want with it. You can't force us to even admit everyone we've made deals with to exploit your IP. Um, we are not going to, we, we disagree that we owe you any money uh, as your share for anything we do with this. So we're not going to give you the details of our agreement so that you would have an amount to come after us with. And they just blatantly just said, you know, you can't do any of this. Um, and uh, and that's when I decided that uh, okay, there's there's a fight coming. Uh, is there any possibility of winning it? Uh, and if there is, it's got to be something. I'm not going to try the same things that others have tried in the past. Steve Gerber suing for the rights to Howard the Duck and uh, yeah, you know various other things. It's always been hammered down. So let's say let's see if there's other ways. Uh, to get the same results, and 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 I think part of it is to uh, is to change the arena, take it out of uh, uh, take it out of uh, gentlemen's boardrooms and uh, into the back alley. Yeah, I mean, what well, metaphorically well, speaking. Yeah, well, well, I congratulate you for making yeah, that I, move. I yeah. really do. I think it's honestly we're all watching it right we're all seeing the news we're seeing what's going on we see the disrespect honestly with a lot of creators that have been in the industry for 20 plus years um not getting a the proper recognition not getting the proper pay still for things they've done not getting the proper credit and what you did out there i think is a is a strong move it's a very strong move and uh we actually just got another super chat in cecil says what's up cecil uh, they're nuts. Warner Brothers should be keeping Bill happy and start churning out fables, books, and movies. Warner Brothers seems to be more interested in propaganda than profit. How how much of that is Warner Brothers? Uh, well, actually, let me ask you this question, because obviously, you know, the big two are owned by big corporations. So when it comes to DC's handling, is that strictly DC's handling, or is that Warner Brothers handling? I don't. I don't know where. One of the frustrations was not being able to find out who the DC executives are answering to. They will. Mm -hmm. uh, they will not reveal that information to me because I wanted uh, basically to go over their heads and and say, okay, look, these guys are uh, screwing the pooch here. Maybe you uh, uh, you want a chance to fix it because you're about to uh, to lose it. Um, they aren't about to to reveal who those people are. So so the answer is I can't I can't tell you. But okay, I can't tell you this much. Uh, DC, it what they did, and not just to me. I mean, this is this goes back uh. decades. Makes a lot of sense when you think in terms of corporations and answering to shareholders and such. DC will never have to answer for all of the wonderful properties and profits they would have made if they just 
for example, kept Alan Moore happy. If they mm -hmm. didn't try and cheat him in small, petty ways, um, who knows if he's happy, what he would have continued to create for them over the past 40 years. There's never going to be a way to figure out how much that would have been, what their mm -hmm. losses are. The, there are losses and they must be huge, but they're all, they're all potential. They're all, you know, nebulous fantasy losses. Um, there's no way a board member can say we've lost this much because you couldn't keep him happy. Uh, but they pissed it away uh, for relatively a few dollars just because they tried to cheat him on, on some merchandise with the, uh, the Watchmen watches. Uh, it's just like, no, you don't get any part of this because this is advertising. That small little bit of pettiness, which, you know, the, that was the nail for one of which the, the shoe was lost, the horse was lost, the battle was lost, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, they, but they can measure that. They can measure, well, this is how much we kept by cheating Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons out of their share of this. Um, that's the the, uh, the the corporate mindset. That is the the answer to the board of directors. They will never uh, know what they could have done, uh, fables wise, profit wise, mm -hmm. in a what would happen if because they don't think in those terms and they cannot. They yeah. they don't hire people that can think in those terms. Right. Um, so it is inevitable that this, this was going to happen. It's the old, you know, at some point you work with lions and tigers. It's, you know, they are going to turn on you someday. It's just, you know, how much good entertainment can you get before that happens? Um, yeah. I am chagrined by the way DC is acting in, in this case. I'm not surprised. Uh, I would be stupid beyond belief to have been surprised by this. Yeah. Now with, with the kind of this back and forth, this growing, I don't want to say animosity, but this growing concern uh, uh, with DC and stuff. Now with the sales of the graphic novels and the books and everything, are, are you comfortable that they've been honest with sales and everything with you on top of this? Do you trust, you know, that, that their accounting has, you know, have been just with the sales of everything, or is that something? Not a bit. At? No, as a matter of fact, I keep catching them on. So the, the last time I held their feet to the fire, that they have to uh, uh, redo their sales. They found thirty dollars, uh, thirty thousand dollars worth of uh, undeclared royalties that they owed me. Hmm. Um, wow. There's a there's another round of that coming up with their latest uh, uh, royalty report. You have to. You have to be something of a forensic uh, uh, accountant to see what are they leaving out. What what uh, mm -hmm. here's everything they're admitting to. What are they not reporting? Um, it really is uh, in a in a just world they would not only have to when I when I'm forced to hold their feet to the fire and to you have to revisit this royalty report and this one and this one and this one. Um, you know, I don't get paid for any of that. And and it actually right. works out. If they miss $30,000 of royalties and it takes me half a year to, to catch it. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a third, third. Yeah. Yeah, so it's almost like why not put it in the public yeah. domain because they're not friggin' paying you for the darn thing right. anyway. Yeah. Well, so... So we so we've got two super chats here. I want to get to them, and then I want to ask you another question um, from Christian Bar Barraza. Uh, Bill, big fan. You include myths into most of your works, both respecting the source and having unique takes on it. What would you say is your favorite pantheon, and what resources do you use when researching mythology? Oh boy, good um, that's a good question. Great, that's a great question. Yeah, I want Thank to know you. that. I let's know that. let's do the second part first because I can answer that, which is everything everything. I, I will read everything about everything. I became interested in mythology through Marvel Comics of all places when I was a little kid and I was in the backyard discussing how Thor was just the coolest character ever. 
he was in the comics. This was early on. And my brother said, oh, you know, that character's ripped off. And I go, no, come on. He goes, no, it's, he, he's in the encyclopedia. That's a, that's a character from uh, the encyclopedia uh, that your precious Marvel comics just stole and, and pretending that they created. Um, my brother had opinions, but <laughs> I, went to the, I went to the encyclopedia to prove him wrong and found Thor right there. That's how I discovered Norse myth. Um, and, I'll, and also discovered it's like, wow, there's so much in this North myth, Norse myth um, that uh, Marvel's doing nothing with. I mean, they, they should, it's just full of just incredible stuff. Uh, that started my, my love affair with mythology. So, so maybe uh, just for position, it would have to be the Norse uh, sagas that, uh, that capture my imagination most. Mignola said it's got to be Norse because they have the best monsters, and there's, there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Uh, but the Greeks, because they're petty and mean, and, and, uh, and there's so much. I mean, they, 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 had a, they have a Greek god for anything, <laughs> for anything, you know. I'm sure there were mis Greek gods of nose picking or what what have you. Um, uh, but any any mythology, they're, they're, it's just so wonderful. And then uh, fairy tales are, are much the same thing. Uh, and it and it changed my as I grew to love that era area of uh, uh, storytelling more. Uh, in other ways, um, I was an early part with the elementals of making superheroes kind of gritty and practical and uh, and that um, elementals came out uh, uh, not before Miracle Man, but before Watchmen and, uh, you know, not before Dark Knight Returns, but uh, I, I mean, not before uh, Miller's Daredevil, but before Dark Knight Returns. So it was part of that that movement towards the uh, the darker soul of superheroes. Uh, and then hand in hand with that was the, the follow-up movement to explain everything, to do handbooks of the Marvel Universe, to just codify this guy stronger than this guy and this and this and this is how this works and all that. And uh, in hindsight, I see that that was a mistake. Superheroes are best when they're fairy tales. Mm. Um, Superman can pull planets through space on the on the end of a big chain because, and here's the explanation: Superman can pull planets through space on the end of a big chain. That's right. It. That's how. That's how. And that when you, you know, thing I I learned in fairy tales is they never apologize or explain. They say if, if someone puts on his seven league boots, he can take seven league strides, and they never say, "Now come on, I know you're not going to believe this, but it's true." They don't because the authority of the storyteller uh, is absolute. Yeah. Uh, they can do this because I just said they can do this. And uh, uh, and I think that's where uh, super heroics as just one arm of, of comic storytelling um, has not only lost so much, but, but thrown it away. Mm -hmm. um, bring back the fairy tale aspect uh, of these characters. So anyway, I love that's fairy tales. So great. I love yeah. That's what's so great about that late, the late Silver Age Marvel and early Bronze Age Marvel. Um, and as you said, like with the 80s came and everything was dark. Yes. I think everything was negative and and I mean I think it spilled over to the DC films. Um the, the color palette's muddy and it's just depressing, as opposed to I think the Marvel films tried to capture that spirit. Mm -hmm. You know that you know. Um, aside from, of course, Endgame or something like that. Well, but, for a while, know, Iron did, Man yeah. and the Captain yeah. America. You know yeah. that, and they were fun. And and uh, I agree. We we have a uh, the other super chat. Yeah, we've got. Yeah, we actually had a couple more super chats yeah. in for you, Bill. Um, you want to grab this one, Bill, or you want me to put it up? Uh, is it the center one or the? Uh, here, I got this one here. So we've got uh, Rogers, Cadenhead. Uh, thank, thank you for the bold and generous move of giving your characters to the public domain. 
What do you say to people who claim the shared copyright on the issues of fables means that you don't own the characters and setting? Uh, my um, take on it uh, in a nutshell is this. Uh, every single one of the indices show that I own the trademarks for all these characters and that uh, DC and I jointly own the copyright. Now, DC is saying that they own the copyright. Right. Well, what happened to my half of it? If I also own the copyright, then I literally have the right to say make copies. Mm -hmm. Either it exists or it doesn't, and we're going to find out. I hope we're going to find out. Uh, um, we'll see. But uh, uh, DC has made their statement only by virtue of they're the, the big bully right now and are used to getting their way. We'll see if that holds up. All right. And then we got uh, Travis Patrick, uh, Perrick, sorry, uh, $5 super chat. Thank you, sir. Bill, did you ever get the rights to Elementals? If so, will there ever be an omnibus? Also, what happened to the book Coventry? There? Was, you there, Bill? That was, yeah. Sorry, you guys froze up for a bit, or maybe I froze up. Do you want um, me to repeat that? Or? No, I got it. I got it. Okay. Uh, the Elementals is, is gone as far as my ownership of it. When I said that that too is in the public domain, I said, I suspect it is because uh, Andrew Rev, who, who bought the rights along with buying Kamiko, um, never protected it. He, mm. he, he practically went out of his way to, to push the property into the public domain. That that's my guess, but it is just just a guess. I uh, I don't have any uh, strong desire to revisit that, so I'll never know. Will there ever be collection of, of omnibuses? No, no, because the uh, uh, the fellow's inept. Uh, mm -hmm. He can't get books out. He mm -hmm. uh, um. He is as, in this business, you can kind of be a crook, you can kind of be an idiot, and you can kind of, uh, uh, um, there was a third part of that triumvirate, the, the crook, the idiot, and the, uh, uh, idle company. But if you're all three, you, you, can't, you can't do it. And, and that was all three. Um, so, yeah, don't look for anything more with the elementals unless unless some bold person takes upon himself to say, you know, this guy is a hollow man, a paper tiger. He's never he's never going to protect it. I just I, I'm just going to go ahead and do it myself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not suggesting you do it. I'm just saying that's mm -hmm. that's the only way you'll ever see those particular characters again. Mm. Um, you know, they had their moment. Uh, if you if you want more things like Elementals, go do something like that. Um, yes. It won't look, the Elementals was a, a creature of its time. Uh, bringing it back now, it would not quite fit, nor would it work. Uh, do something new. Twice in my life before he died, I got to talk to Jack Kirby. And in both cases, he worked into the conversation as like, you want to do me honor? Do your own characters. Don't mm -hmm. try and honor me by doing my characters. Uh, yeah. I've invented them all. You know, I've done them. Now go do your stuff. Uh, and uh, boy, I, you know, it took me a while to learn that. But eventually... It's tough, too, because you grow up loving these characters, right? That's yes. why you get into it. 
I'm sure you didn't you, get into it for sure. the chicks and the money. <laughs> yeah. But, I, you know, but at the same token, I, I get what, what you're saying and the advice you got, Bill, because <laughs> if you're able to create a great IP that's your own, but you can say, hey, it was influenced by so-and-so. I mean, to me, that's a great way to carry on someone's legacy, of, yeah. of yeah. especially when you get influence. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and we got a great comment from Jimmy here. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, for one, would love a world where Bill only publishes his own ideas and not published with other IPs. Well, for whatever time is is left me, uh, we're in that world, uh, yeah. Jimmy. So, mm -hmm. um, hey, hey, Bill. Welcome. Now you're not. Are are you now done? You say like elementals. You might be done with that. We don't know about that. But what about fables? Are you done with fables? You've you've taken control of your own destiny with your own creator own IP. That even DC the the copyright trademark says it's yours in their indicia, and you and you you put it out there. You gave it as a, as a gift to everyone. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. Now, what about you? Have uh, is this the end of fables for you? Have you thought about Kickstarter's, Indiegogo's yourself, crowdfunding to maybe do one less or or do another like a 48 pager or a mini series or something like that the the contracts between me and dc still exist uh yeah. my point is that for those of you out there who now also own fables 100 those contracts don't exist for you they do for me um dc and i are locked together until that is resolved in some definite way uh so don't look for any new fables from me. Now that said, uh, it looks like uh, the rest of this twelve-issue uh, revisitation of fables uh, in the Black Forest, uh, the three missing issues, uh, will come out. I just did the final corrections on issue one hundred and sixty, um, whose subtitle uh, says something like. Uh, in which politics rears its ugly head. So it's very timely for what I'm going through right now. Mm. But uh, um, yeah, it looks like they're, they're gonna come out. Uh, but like I said, I, I, I finished those scripts two years ago. I'm, I'm done with DC. So as long as DC still has uh, something to do with fables, I'm, I'm probably done with fables. I've got, I've got ideas that I, will never get to though. I mean, uh, ideas are not, not the problem. Um, and uh, perhaps because of this latest brouhaha, he just got a, an offer that is probably going to happen on a new book with a different publisher. Um, oh, good luck. There was other things already in the works uh, before this. Um, I am uh, not done with storytelling and if I really want to stick it to DC, um, I'll I'll be more than I am just petty enough to come out with uh, a new book about Snow White and the Big Bad Wolf, who are not the same Snow White and the Big Bad Wolf from Fables, but but are a different take on public domain characters. Um, right. Uh, just to uh, tweak those arrogant idiots in the nose. Yeah. Uh, I can be that petty. Now, Bill, yeah. you said you were pretty much being ignored by them uh, for your yes. request uh, for for DC until you issued that statement. Yeah. Who was it that actually contacted you? Did anyone contact you in person by via phone, or was it just? Did they oh no 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 they no they they issued that statement. They have not contacted me. Uh, <laughs> they have not spoken to me since. Holy shit. Uh, I suspect whatever's going to happen is, you know, uh, and maybe deservedly so is going to come at me as a surprise. This yeah. is as what I, I gave him plenty of warning that this thing was coming without actually saying what it was. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I don't expect the same courtesy from them, but I do expect some kind of uh, response from them. But see, I, I believe that the statement that came out as badly worded as it was, 
was them scrambling. They don't do anything quickly. Uh, this was almost unheard of to, for them to release something so quickly. But they had to stop the bleeding quickly. Correct. Um, yeah. And now that they've got that out there, uh, they're probably taking in more measure. Like, what do we do now? Mm. That's my guess. I, if I could think like them, I would be like them, and then I wouldn't much like myself, would I? Mm. Yeah. So, so is this a done deal? Is this actually going to happen, or is this in the process of trying to happen? What's that? Getting fables into public domain. Well, either it happened or it didn't. I suspect it did. Yeah, you declared it. You can't. You public domain from as what from what I can tell you, you can't say just kidding, folks. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking it back. You can't do it. Uh, there's no precedent though that I could find for something like this. So I guess we'll see. Uh, the problem now is that we're living in a day, an age where judges and such. Uh, don't feel compelled to follow the law so much as follow what uh, hmm. uh, what they want the law to be. So right. uh, I guess we'll see. Yeah. Well, do, well, do you have to file the paperwork, or you can just declare it? There is no paperwork for for putting something in putting something purposely into the public domain is a unicorn. There's mm -hmm. there's almost no precedent for it. Uh, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find a single public domain uh, lawyer who, who could <laughs> even understand my question, much less uh, speak authoritatively about it. So no, there's no form to follow. Okay. Mm. Uh, if if it's possible, I've done it. If it's not possible, well, if it's not possible, then actual ownership of properties doesn't exist because if you can't do what you want with your own stuff mm -hmm. exactly not your yeah. own stuff yeah. and you could feel yeah you could feel the frustration you could read the frustration and feel it in your statement and how you were saying that the company that that you you know when you that you went into an agreement with with fables is not the same company anymore those no it no are longer exists yeah, it no longer exists. Your champions like Jeanette and like Dan, who you know, who were always in your corner, always supported you, pushed you. They're gone. They were tossed aside. They were tossed out. And now you're you're dealing with a company that I don't even know if they have a permanent office now, because no editor has an office. They're they're switching cubicles. Right. You know that that shows how how mercurial this company is right now. So what? You, you, and. and 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 then how they again they come after you with this that is something yours you could just it just it reeks of such desperation on their part because it seems like the lunatics are running the asylum over there yeah well it, yeah yeah exactly. I, I, I have a question for you i don't know if this is something you can answer however so I know, you know, you talked about Dan DiDio and having a good connection with him uh, yeah. it, it, when doing stuff. You talked about Jim Lee having your back and everything and, and kind of something I always wondered. You know, Jim Lee was... <laughs> well, Jim, Jim Lee, Lee said he had my back. He didn't. Yeah. But, yeah. But the, with, he's, a, he's a man without honor. Yeah. You know, with, with Jim Lee, you know, obviously he had his fame with Marvel, right? And he's... He's one of the guys that helped launch Image and this big revolution, blah, blah, blah. Then he goes over to D.C. I mean, is is he so disconnected now, you know, where he currently is that, you know, did he did he? Well, maybe he never knew. But is he so disconnected now with with the guys that were making these amazing books and everything to, to where we are now with comics? I don't know. I uh, those that speculate that he is just a figurehead. I can see some sense in coming to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know them. I, I've had several conversations with them uh, and uh, even had a very convivial dinner. Uh, I think it was his birthday dinner with him once. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know the man. Um, I cannot 
speak to his character other than how he's interacted with me, which is to call me up blatantly lie to me for 20 minutes uh, and then dismiss me as if I didn't matter. Um, yeah. Which is his prerogative. I do not need to matter to him, but uh, yeah. uh, he does not thereby earn any respect from me as a result. Mm -hmm. And we got, uh, I think we have three super chats here yeah. for you. Yeah, let's jump through these really quick. So we've got, uh, oh, let's see. We have Christian again, right? Oh, I think we've got Mr. Is it Mr. Oh. Biggins? Did you do this one already? Uh, Mr. Biggins, uh, $20 super chat. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bill, big fan back to Elementals. When are you going to step into the wild and lucrative world of crowdfunding? We need a seasoned independent writer. Thank you for that $20 super chat. Excellent question. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I'm old and set in my way. I, I am all for crowdfunding. Um, I suspect the, uh, the part of it in getting books actually printed and out the door, uh, it, it are more new tricks than this old dog can learn. I'm, I'm a little wary of it in that regard. Um, but who knows? Maybe, uh, uh, maybe I do have a crowdfunding thing in me. Um, I think you got a lot of people, a lot of a lot of us out there. You know, you have Jimmy in here. Uh, you know, Cecil. A lot of people that I'm sure that that any assistance you need, <laughs> I know I for one would well, be more than than happy to. Well, well, hang out with us after the show, and we'll bring you up to speed on a few things in the works. You're gonna teach me how to crowdfund. Yeah, in, yeah, in, in an easy five minute lesson. Oh, yeah, I got a lot of yeah, yeah, And we have another you. super chat. Uh, Christian, thank you so much. Right? We didn't do this one uh, yet. Nope. Um, uh, Bill, what happened to Restoration, the image comic that was announced? Can we look forward to seeing more comics from you? I'm enjoying your novels and looking forward to whatever else you put out. Thank you, Christian, for that. Okay, chat. Restoration was a book. Uh, I was going to do it, Image Comics. Um, with a uh, uh, a terrific artist, um, the I'm I've long been worried about don't announce things until things are done. Uh, I I yield the pressure when we announce it too soon, and the details between the artist, myself, and and my agent at the time. Um, never got worked out to anyone's satisfaction. So finally, we just had to uh, mutually decide to go our own ways. Um, that said, uh, I have uh, just learned, possibly because of this last six days, uh, that there is no resentment on the part of Eric Stevenson at Image um, and that that door is still open. Uh, so we're talking. Will I do more comics? Yes. Will I do more novels? Yes. As a matter of fact, I am, in addition to everything else on my plate right now, writing a novel for a publisher for, like, not my self-published thing, uh, 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 a, what I consider a pretty big deal um, that uh, that... I guess it's going to happen because I'm already behind on how many pages of it I should have done by now, which is the hallmark of everything I've ever done in my career. Uh, I forget. Was there anything else he asked in there? But uh, yes, more comics, more novels, um, at least just, once more in my life, I'm going to write a movie that will never get made. Oh, there we go. He's enjoying um, your novels and looking forward to what else you put out, especially that maybe unproduced screenplay that you'll put out and share with the world. Then, <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe it will get produced. Uh, you know, I may have lied to you about one thing about the will I ever do more fables stuff. Weirdly enough, in a contract that exists, um, there are sometimes when you sign rights over, there's something called holdbacks, like 
you can have the right to do this and this and this, but we we hold on to the right to do this thing. Uh, DC relented on one thing, which is uh, I have the sole right to do stage plays and radio plays with fables. Uh, I have written a boatload of radio play stuff with fables. Um, there were some false starts because at first I was going to just adapt the existing stories and, and just say, you know, that's not as fun as it could be. Uh, so instead I'm filling in some of the gaps using, using radio play screen uh, scripts to uh, fill in stories with fable stories that should have happened or, or uh, you know, might yet happen. Um, uh, I just, I will probably lead out with one about uh, interest to me. Um, so yeah, there may be there may be more fable stuff uh, in in that one little uh, corner uh, that DC. Well, I'd say they can't lay claim to, but apparently they can lay claim to all sorts of stuff they don't actually own. Um, but they haven't said they own it yet, uh, nor these new comics with other publishers has anyone from DC claimed that they've owned that yet too. Uh, will that happen? I don't know because yeah. I can no longer, you know, trust them to tell the truth. Yeah. That yeah, was a cheap not... I, I apologize. No, I mean... you're, you're great. I, we're going over, uh, yeah, uh, and we got another five dollar. We got a five dollar super chat. Wr Winter, sincere, sincere thanks for creating fables. It got me into comics. Looking forward to new adventures with Big B and Snow. All right, I didn't quite catch that because we had a, a freeze up again. Oh, sorry. Sincere says, thanks uh, for creating fables. Got in the comics. Looking forward to new adventures with Big B and Snow. Got it. All right, uh, I appreciate it, Mister Winter, Miss Winter, Winter. Yes. Yeah. Now, so what's so I know you've done yeah. some stuff with Fire and Ice. Uh, anything else new? Anything new else coming out from you? Um, anytime anyone from the Frazetta Girls mm -hmm. picks up the phone and asks me to do anything, the answer is yes, unless uh, uh, unless it involves something I'm just physically incapable of doing. Uh, but yeah, if they if they need a body moved, I'm I'm there to help. Uh, so, yes, Excellent. yes, there will be more. Oh, uh, all six Jeff issues of, of my Fire and Ice story are done, uh, and I've just started doing a one-shot Tigra thing at their request. Uh, and there is uh, definitely at least one more big thing on the horizon, oh, which I will leave for them to announce when the time is right. Yeah, we awesome. we adore them. So we're big big fans of of Sarah Ann and uh, Holly and the Frazetta girls. And we have another uh, two dollar super chat from Ladies Man two seven two seven. Thank you, Bill. Have you watched? Have you played or watched Wolf Among Us? Uh, as part of the uh, the marketing for the first game. Uh, they actually sent a camera crew to, to film me playing the game. Uh, so I have played it. Uh, it. My attitude towards it was there was a lot of things I wouldn't have done, but uh, the structure of Wolf Among Us is you're, you're at a point of decision and there's usually four choices you can make at any given time. Uh, I followed a through line as like as long as, since it, focus on Bigby Wolf. As long as there was at least something in those four choices that would have been, yes, that's what Bigby Wolf would have done in my mind in this. I, I said, yeah, that, that works. Because you can't, you know, games are interactive to the extent that the, the player is writing part of the story. You can't do that for him. You can't insist. No, you have to choose this. Or, but as long as there's at least one choice that uh, that matched what uh, what I felt was authentic to the character. Uh, I was uh, all for it. Uh, I've since read uh, forcing DC to come out 
uh, cough up the script for the second Wolf Among Us game, uh, I sense read that, that a lot of that's all out the table. Now, now they are characters that are unrecognizable to me. Oh, understood. And actually, that ties into his second super chat here, uh, ladies man seven two seven. Are they still making Wolf Among Us too? And they have they talked to you about it? Uh, I don't know if they're still making Wolf Among Us too. Uh, I would advise them if they they have any character at all to to kill that project. Uh, are they talking to me? No, they have never once. Now you got to understand the Wolf Among Us Telltale Games crew that did the first game. Uh, I think some of them carried over, but it's a different company. Uh, at one point when it was first announced, uh, I got a call at the San Diego show that says, "We will, when the time is right, we will bring you on board and uh, get your advice, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Uh, that was years, years ago. Uh, they've never, never picked up the phone. And part of the talks with DC was that they assigned a special guy who was the liaison between me and Telltale Games to try and work out my problems with that game. Mm -hmm. uh, that DC person, uh, whom I half believe doesn't actually exist, has never actually picked up the phone to me, even though it prompts, oh, he'll email you soon. He'll call you today. <laughs> um no, no, they've never, ever spoken to me. Uh, I have not exchanged any words. The only thing I know about the game is the announcement they made that was released on, on YouTube. Uh, and the only thing I found out there is they ripped off a piece of my art that DC never owned uh, and Telltale Games never paid me for or asked me to use. Uh, um, and also they broke the, the contractually they have to give me credit whenever they uh, market this stuff or, or put out the games and they they didn't do that either that telltale games as as a, a, an offshoot of DC in this regard uh, it's just like the the apple not falling far from the tree they have they're always in breach always always breaking their their contract um hmm. yeah yeah God. and we got a, another super they just keep coming in here uh from mr. mr biggins Biggin. thank you mr biggins bill uh this is in uh this is a crowdfunding reference for you bill uh bill you will make a killing and have 100 experienced knowledgeable people tripping over themselves to help you with the logistics great artists beating a path to your door crowdfunding is the ultimate f you to the corporate tools <laughs> I absolutely agree. Uh, I believe the future of comics for the foreseeable future is crowdfunding. I'm, I'm only wary of my ability to, uh, to do this after, after 40 years training myself to, you know, never pay attention to that aspect of the business. Um, I'm all for it. Uh, I, but at the same time, you know, I partnering up with someone who can do the things I don't know how to do. Uh, I'm wary of partners right now because, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, look, look what's happened recently when when you're in partnership with uh, uh, with people of, of no perceivable character. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely understood and yeah. we got another uh another super chat here and then we'll we'll, we'll wrap up uh thank bill we are going into this is from william sleeper thank you sir bill we are going into a new golden sil slash silver era for the audio radio several good wolverine miniseries on spotify batman audio drama on max streaming yeah i'm sort of vaguely aware of uh, those things which is one of the reasons why i wouldn't uh wouldn't mind getting some uh fables radio plays out of there especially since mm -hmm. uh um, they come with uh, with no DC participation, and I think that is the the spice of life right now. Mm -hmm. um, here's my opinion on comic books. Comic books will never go away. Now, everyone's talking about how the comics industry is dying, and the comics industry is always dying uh, because mm -hmm. there's always companies going belly up. There always will be. There's always new ways to get comics in people's hands starting and there always will be comics were the very first written language in humanity 70 years ago seventy thousand years ago 
the very first written language of humankind were graphic images in sequence to tell a story. Uh, there were paintings on the sides of caves. Uh, all of civilization was built on that. The very, uh, the, the prose uh, alphabets we use were slowly transformed into that from, from comet, from pictograms. Uh, when we have important information that we can't allow uh, people to, to be unclear on, we put it in comic form. We put the skull and crossbones on bottles of poison. You know, we put little diagrams on, on road hazards, things like that. We always default back to comics to give out important information. And when civilization falls, and it will, uh, hopefully not before uh, I shuffle off this mortal coil, but when it does, <laughs> and rises again, the one language will be pictograms, will be comics. Mm. Um, it's the one language that everybody knows. Uh, one of the things I do to demonstrate to, uh, uh, to elementary and uh, middle school art classes uh, is I hold up a single sentence in various uh, languages. Um, and, and demand that these kids tell me what it says. And of course they don't. And it's like, how can you not know? It clearly says what it says right there. And the reason is that, that all these written languages have to be learned. They have to be learned painstakingly over 20 years of your life. But then you hold up the same thing. The sentences were all, it was a dark and stormy night mm. in, in Swahili and you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. You hold up a picture of dark and stormy night, everyone gets it. Right. Um, that is the written language that is hardwired into our brains. Uh, we are temporary stewards of the most powerful storytelling tool that will ever exist. So comics will never entirely go away. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll... Uh, It'll change forms and how it gets into people's hands many, many times. Um, and the cool things that, that people are going to find out to get comics in people's hands uh, in you know 20 years from now, we none of us know what that's going to be. But but they'll continue uh, to exist, and we're part of it. Uh, prose fiction, it's only been around for, I don't know, 6,000 years at most, and that's that's a blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. All you Johnny-come-latelys with your, you know, <laughs> pro books. Yeah, maybe that trend will catch on someday, but uh, but those of us in the in the 70,000-year comics field, you know, we're rooting for you. Yeah. Uh, you're welcome mm. to join the storytellers, but, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that pro thing will catch on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, another super chat just popped up for you here. Uh, Panthe from Christian Barraza, uh, four ninety nine. Thank you, sir. Uh, Pantheon was an amaz was amazing and had an end that hinted at the potential return of the heroes. Have you thought about a sequel or coming back to that world? Uh, yes. Let's put that in line behind, you know, ten thousand <laughs> other things. Um, <laughs> okay. One thing I may crowdfund and I don't know if this is possible, is right now I'm I'm at a, enough years down the road in my life to where I have books and notebooks and, and, and hard drives, uh, thumb drives full of fragments of stories that I'll never get to. Uh, and uh, um, one of the things I'm considering is let's put all of those in a big book, uh, free ideas, not free because you buy you the book. Buy from you. you. You buy the rights to have any of the, these ideas and exploit them by buying the book. And uh, maybe I'll do something like, because there are so, there are so many stories uh, that I, I still want to tell. Uh, Whoever is working on immortality, hurry up, please, because I I need I need the years in which to get to these. Well, you you are an incredibly generous person. Um, 
again, that that could be a, a fun crowdfunding project too, right there. You know, ha I'm giving you a gift, <laughs> keys to the kingdom, hundred bucks each. There you yeah. go. Make yourself two hundred grand. <laughs> yeah, that might be a bit. But, the lost yeah. stories of Bill Willingham. Yeah, back yeah. In the years. <laughs> but like I said, you are such a gentleman. You are you are a, a, a statesman. You are an ambassador to to our craft. Um, again, so many indie creators that I've talked to, because believe you me, we've been talking, um, uh, about you all good. Um, and just the guts, like you were talking about color Sergeant born and, you know, and a bayonet with some guts behind it. I think that's, uh, that's yeah. you right yeah. there. You've really, you really channeled your inner color Sergeant born. Um, but, uh, and, and it's very disheartening to see, uh, that you had gotten some, People attacked you on social media. I, I I find it astonishing these these people, and and a lot of them seem to be kind of like not hippies, but kind of free spirits and all. And you know that used to be all for individualism and free expression, and things like that. And now they seem to be towing the corporate line and on the side of these companies, you know these the these these big publishing houses who. Uh, who deem their creators so their creatives so insignificant that when everything shut down for COVID for three weeks, they issued a pencils down order to the vast yeah. majority of their creatives. So here's someone yes. who's inking, and the page rates haven't changed or they've gone down. Here's someone that's that's inking so that they could put food on their table for a hundred dollars a page. For someone who's lettering for ten dollars a page, and these multi-billion dollar corporations are telling their creatives, the ones that drive the engine, the heart and soul of these supposed corporations, we can't afford to pay you ten thousand dollars, you know, for an issue <laughs> to draw it. You know, it, it's it's astonishing. And then these people come out and they want to defend them, the, these so-called fans. Um, it's Defend the corporations if you wish, but they are done. Uh, they're huge. Remember, Rome took 500 years to fall once the rot had already set in. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's going to take a while, but they're done. Yeah. The only resources they have are the stuff they dig up from corpses. Uh, they don't have anything new. Uh, the new comics are coming out from other venues. Um, I think on some level the corporations realize it and it scares them, but uh, at the same time, they can't, you know, they can't recreate themselves into the businesses capable of doing what new comics are going to do from now on. Uh, I may not see their demise, and I don't know. You guys are looking a little long in the tooth. Maybe you won't, but uh, uh, <laughs> soon after us, uh, yeah, it will happen. It it's already dead, but like the chicken with its head cut off, um, you know, it's going to stagger around for a little longer before it realizes it. Uh, so yeah, you know, if if uh, uh, certain rabble rousing elements want to support that go, go right ahead. You're, you know, you're, you're standing up for, for the dead. Um, yeah. Oh, I and, love that. And not in, in a respectful way. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. but you're done. Your, your time is over. Yep. Sit down go home. It's, um, the, the folks like what what you're doing, what what uh, Ethan Van Skyver are doing, all these all these hot young Turks, every one of them coming out with their crowdfunding and 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 doing their uh, their streaming and stuff. Like you know, God bless all of you. What a what a great time. I'm glad I saw it. Uh, maybe I'll get in on a little bit of it. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm just tickled that it's happening. Um, but we're glad and we're, we're glad though that that you've uh, figured out you know how to stream it's uh we'd love to see more of you all of our channels. yeah you're more than welcome to come on whenever <laughs> yeah. you want 
I figured out how to stream the way a, a monkey figures out how to fly a space capsule, which is he does not know what's going on. He doesn't know he's in space. He, he barely knows he's in a capsule, but he has been learned by, by virtue of food pellets to punch certain buttons in certain order. <laughs> and when someone takes me by the hand, like Niall did, and, and gives me these certain buttons to push in a certain order, this happens. Could I, you know, a lot of times I, I get messages from, from some of the, the streamers that will say things like, I'm doing a such and such a stream, join in if you want to, with no instructions on how that yeah. happens, because they assume I know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. And if you teach me once how to do it, the next time you have to teach me again. I'm That's not. Uh, that was it. Was it? Yeah. That was it. It wasn't hard. It was painless, wasn't it, Nile? Yeah, I didn't think it was too hard. We got it. Yeah. We got yeah. it. He's here. We've been chatting with him. Yeah, the great, the great Dan Lawless. Thank you, Dan. Uh, said bless you, Bill. Hey, uh, what a great and, artist he is, man. He is fantastic. Uh, talk about yeah. the Frazetta stuff, right, man? Well, I keep, you know, I keep. Uh, there are things coming up where they say, "What kind of uh, artist would be inter Would you be interested in in doing covers for us?" And and uh, um, without any permission, I, I've never met the guy, but Dan Lawless's name oh. comes up often as here's someone you should uh, should reach out to before he gets too big for his own britches. That's um, right, yeah. these young whippersnappers. Right. Well, you hey, got to step in line. I, wanna, I don't know if we're we're closing up here. Before we we get away, I, I need I need something cleared up for me, Billy. Mm -hmm. uh, your last name is Tucci. That is Italian. I mean, yes. And I I know that because you know one of my favorite actors, Stanley Tucci, mm -hmm. same name. Mm -hmm. But you are a uh, a kilt and tartan guy. In yeah, so, yeah. So, <laughs> right, so, here's, here's, so I'm I'm born an Elliot. So my my last name is I was born William Elliot. Um, uh, my mother is all all Italian. My mother's a, a Sicilian. My ancestry uh -huh. down right down to her town. I grew up in a huge Italian family. Um, my father was killed um, a few months before I was born. So okay. I was adopted by Tucci and raised ah. as, as a Tucci until I did my ancestry. And I knew that I was born in Elliot, but I was told I was always English until I learned I was a, a lowland border Scot. But the, the Willinghams and the Elliots, you guys, you, you're, you are us. Because um, uh, I'm not a Celt. We're not Celts. We came from Normandy with um, uh, all Elliots fought with William the Conqueror. And the Willinghams, ah. came up, the, Will, the Willinghams, your very famous last name, uh, the Willinghams yeah. as well came from Normandy, from Norm, from, from Normandy, and with William the Conqueror. So yeah. Um, yeah. that that's who we are. Uh, for, my family kept going all the way up to the to the borders of Scots to Scotland, and okay, hating the English and fighting them. And the <laughs> and the the kilts you wear are they your clan? That's our tartan. Them? Yep, yep. That's our okay. Tartan. Right. And no one. Right. So the yeah. the, thing, the funny thing about kilts is that, um, you know, they would say only Highlanders wore kilts, and that's true. But they wore the great kilts. If you see, you know, great um, Braveheart and stuff. In 1830 is when I think King George the Fourth actually um, wore a kilt, and that became then all the Scottish families started to wear kilts they had their tartans uh, some of the, the ones that didn't have their tartans they picked their tartans but only true Scots uh, had blue in their tartan like the elliots a lot of a lot of us lowlanders have that because you know if you see braveheart and stuff and you know they're highlanders when they got up there to fight you know my my ancestors have been fighting them for 400 years already <laughs> um and uh i'm elliot with two t's though and all the elliots with two so what happened is once the I'll be real quick. Once the the crown was um, united, when the, the the kingdom was united under one crown, the United Kingdom, they took our Elliots and the Armstrongs, the Armstrongs and the Elliots. We were the two worst clans, and they sent uh, they hung them, <laughs> they sent them to Ulster, Scotland, uh, or ours, who they hung and sent to the Midlands to work in the coal mines. So I'm a two T Elliot. So if you see any Elliots with two t's at the end 
that extra T is from the trees that that your ancestors were hung from. So, oh my goodness, oh, wow. I'm, I'm a descendant of <laughs> of border reavers who were hung. So somewhere down the line, old Uncle Willie or somebody was hung from a tree, and that's who they gave us the second T in our name, <laughs> the the English, so that they would always know who we are. <laughs> you know. Part of my uh, inspiration to go ahead and pull the trigger on this, this uh, as some describe as a stunt, mm. um, was the the line from Braveheart. This man says, "I'm going out to pick a fight." Um, sometimes you sometimes you need to go pick a fight. That's right. Uh, God knows it's. Uh, I've been permanently banned fired from comics like three or four times in my career. Mm. Uh, it never stuck, uh, but it's been a while since I've been in a good knockdown brawl. So, uh, so for better or worse, this is, this is happening. Yeah. And, uh, um, and not to, I mean, not to, to, to sully your history because it, it sounds wonderful, but uh, uh, for Christmas, I think two years ago, a, a friend, uh, bought me one of them Scottish lordships. So, uh, so I'd appreciate it the next time you have me on that uh, uh, that you address me as Laird Bill. I like that. I <laughs> know. A little bit of respect, please. I like that. I love it. Because uh, I'm a Laird as well. My wife bought me a plot of land. We should get little Lego castles and put them there. We should find out where it is. <laughs> put a, little, a little toy castle there. Or that's, you, that's what I want. <laughs> I'm going to really do up. is is at least enough to pitch a pup tent yeah I'd like to go sleep on our on our acres and then we'll anyway. fight or we'll just yeah. ally ourselves against all the other the other lairds and just take over their laird ship because they won't be there we'll be camping they won't well, of course we'll fight we're scuffed but anyway yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but no, you know th th laird willingham danky danky i like that laird willingham yeah there you go yeah, there, there you go. go. Um, I wanted the uh, the the triple crown of unearned uh, uh, merit. Uh, so as a lordship, finally got that a, a doctorate, uh, a fake doctorate, like got that, and and a uh, uh, minister uh, minister's uh, um, ordination. Oh wow! Uh, not one of them earned. Uh, hmm. which I think is uh, is what makes them special. Now, now, Bill, I, I and uh, I'll be I'm going to end it. Uh, for for soldiers, I was in the army too, and I yeah I to someone and and there were some guys uh, at the VFW who actually qualify for the VFW because they did serve in Berlin. Yeah. Um, did, did that work with you as well? Like, can you wear that? That if you had uh, that combat patch, the Berlin Brigade, because you did serve in there, you did well, go there and you did serve. Yeah, it was kind of a, a, a rotation thing. So I'm not, I'd have to look into that. But uh, um, yeah, I, you know, I can't, I can't answer that mm. for you. Um, mm. The, uh, you know, I followed uh, my old units and stuff during the, uh, the Afghanistan War, the 164th Military Police Company, uh, served with distinction at Bagram um, here, here. And, uh, and various other places. Um, the uh, the MPs uh, fighting during the Tet Offensive of the Vietnam War, where uh, they moved from, uh, um, I forgot their designation beforehand, but after after they uh, alone uh, uh, saved uh, Saigon, um, they were moved to uh, combat support status. Uh, so yeah, I, I followed, you know, my guys uh, as much as possible. But I'm not sure uh, what what awards and pomps and such that I can uh, legitimately uh, lay claim to, other than just pride of of uh you know these are my guys absolutely mm -hmm. yeah absolutely well thank you so much sir uh bill please come on again 
Um, maybe we'll get Sarah on. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do some Frazetta Girl books for another book that comes out. We're, Sarah's a, a great friend of the show. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we'll oh, she's, she's a delight. She's yeah. just remarkable. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And Jasper I'll, 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 I'll end with a uh, uh, funny anecdote about Sarah Frazetta. Uh, she called me out of the blue, wanting me to do this fire and ice thing. Um, and I'm talking to her, and she's going on and on. And her enthusiasm is is infectious, yeah. as you probably know. But she's going on and on about one of the things she, one of the reasons she wants me to write this is I remind her so much of her grandpa. Aww. And I'm, I, I know, but here I am befuddled fellow that I often am, I'm saying, okay, so I remind some girl of her grandpa, isn't it? Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm just like, why, you know, is she trying to make me feel old? I remind her of her grandpa. And then, then it hits <laughs> like, oh, her grandpa. Yeah. Uh, and then I spent about the next week floating about uh, six inches off the, you know, yeah. my, my, uh, my head swelled. Like nobody's business. Yeah. yeah, I I love her to death. And grandpa and not was just badass. <laughs> grandpa oh, yeah. was a badass. Yeah. Oh my and uh, yeah, and uh, to, I know we have you going two hours now. Uh, Jasper Plan Nine, thank you for that nine dollars and ninety nine cent super chat. Thanks, Scala and Tucci for hosting. Thanks for joining us, Mister William. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you. I'm sorry I talked your ear off. I, no, are you kidding me? Well, I do on. blabber. I, 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 this is this is truly. A joy for us, um, and an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Um, we're both huge fans, and uh, uh, just just thank you. You know, I know you mm -hmm. know that we've spoken briefly on some streams before when it didn't quite work out or there were some problems. Yeah, yeah. But then I'm like, damn it! Now we have an. I'm getting him on. <laughs> we got to ask him. And plus, once at some show, and they've all all the memories of all the shows have kind of melted together in my mind. Mm -hmm. But you just came up out of the blue and introduced yourself and and just was so so delightful to chat with and uh i i uh, just appreciate that from time to time i'm naturally shy in public so i don't i i suspect i come across as aloof when it's actually like i just don't want to inflict myself on, on people um <laughs> well next time so you're gonna have to you're, go out you're coming up that time was was a uh was a joy uh yeah. I'm a fan. What do you, what, you know, what, what, of course, I'm not like, I gotta say hi, yeah. <laughs> but next time we'll go out for a whiskey. Okay. And then that, that's right. I can, do. And, and I then, can be taught. I can be talked into a whiskey. All right. Well, uh, Niall, anything to say to, to take us out and thank yeah, you. No, th thanks again, Bill, for coming on. We appreciate it. Please come on again. We love having our guests come back on and chat and hang out with us. And, uh, next well, like week, I said, I love being had. So yeah, thank glad you. to do it. Definitely. And next week, everyone will be uh, Thursday Night Live with Billy Tucci with our good friend, uh, Ron Garney. Ron Garney. Let's talk some yes, Berserker. Sir. There you go. Excellent. All right. You ever hang out with All Garney? Right. He's a good dude, too, man. He's a good guy. All right. Well, thank All right. you, guys. Thank you, guys. And thank you, everyone. You want to take us out, brother? All right, everyone. Have a great night. We'll see you all next week with some more streams. Bye. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us on Pop XP. If you haven't already, make sure to click that subscribe button and also click the bell for notifications when we go live and we upload some awesome new content. Also, don't forget to head on over to Twitter and follow us at the Pop XP and over on Instagram at the Pop XP. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you soon.